first of all, I love that we just like came right out the gate with all this serious conversation. We're like, yeah, you know about, what? This yeah, is just, just bombarded. We're, we're in for. This is just a glimpse. The Meg movies are kind of meant to be terrible, right? I haven't seen any, but. Uh, you know, I, I think the first one was designed to be kind of campy and that's kind of mm -hmm. the fun of it. But this new one, um, there's just, there's not, there's nothing to it, you know? <laughs> there's, mm -hmm. And I, I like to stay them. I love giant shark stuff. You know, I have this, I have somewhere in my apartment, I have a giant Megalodon tooth of my own, but uh, nice. there's just, there's just nothing to the movie. Okay. See, I haven't seen either of those, but I, f yeah, I feel like I'd go into those being like, okay, it's going to be silly. It's going to be dumb, expecting yeah. less. But when you take something that's like a cinematic masterpiece, like The Exorcist, and say this is a sequel, yeah, you, you think you'd want to keep it having the at least somewhat the same atmosphere, keeping it in the same realm or universe at all. <laughs> I think that's one of the you know like my issues right now with the current state of film and tv it's that you know the generation of films that i like the 70s the 80s you know you can't make movies like that anymore and the no. stuff that they produce just doesn't hold a, a candle to any of it you know and it's just like as far as like the acting i mean like you know i've seen some great indie films the past few years that are obviously limited mm -hmm. by a budget but just the mainstream stuff it's just we're recycling the same stories and we're we're kind of recycling gimmicks just to have spectacle as opposed to like elevating an art form and elevating uh content for people to be inspired by thank you so much thank <laughs> you so much for saying that because i recorded an ep an episode review last night about the exorcist with one of my friends and we're saying the same thing like it, it just seems to be not about um art at all anymore uh not about the fans of anything anymore not about the audience it's just like here's a product here's content we just want the money. That's all it's about. Yeah. And that's why I that's why I go on like Tubi and stuff and watch like independent movies and you get something at least unique and fresh. And even if the acting is a little whatever, like at least it's like something to root for than this big company just getting the money. And that's all they care about. Oh, I yeah. Well, it's a double edged sword because, you know, like uh, it's one of my favorite indie directors is this guy, Jim Cummings. You know, he did this movie Thunder Road, which I think it won. South by Southwest 2018. And, you know, I think they did that with the $200,000 budget. And for me, it's one of the one of the better stories that we've seen. You know, it's like it follows the typical hero's journey, but it's just a great original twist on it. And you get these kind of low budget films and audiences now, you know, from are kind of trained to recognize spectacle and be like, oh, this is something good. You know, it's like the kids that grew up on Transformers, that grew up on that kind of stuff. Like if you don't have big effects and explosions, I believe sometimes mumblecore films you know like uh films that are, are dialogue heavy that are based on that kind of get pushed to the side as being a sleeper movie and we don't have the attention span to watch something and really get sucked into the story so you know you can kind of have those films on an indie level but the problem is is that the production design budgets don't rival what the 80 90 200 million dollar films do so people watch that and you know visually you are just kind you you don't have the same sensory influx that you do when you're watching these these huge tentpole films so i feel like they kind of lose interest you know like i do have hope for you know obviously this art form and this and this world but it's true it's like subtlety which used to be kind of rewarded and yeah. you know people human connection and stories were just not seeing you know i just went to the the i'm in la and i went to the academy museum and they you know one of my favorite old films is godfather 2 and some of just like the subtlety and the nuance and some of the storytelling and even in godfather 2 there's a like big godfather exhibit at, at lachlan and just to see even like the detail that went into like the desk the costume designs all these mm -hmm. things they had the you know the costume designers just talking about how, like the little minutia of every little thing on these characters and i i don't know if we're putting the same kind of emphasis. I mean, like we are in some of the Oscar bait films, but in general at that time, I don't think people, you know, I, I don't, I think Francis Ford Coppola, there was a recording that he was surprised that it did as well as it did. It's same with Castle, they had the same thing about Casablanca. You know, everyone on the set of Casablanca thought that that movie was gonna completely tank. They were terrified about it, but obviously so much detail, so much, so much, uh, um, you know, uh, thought went into the design, the costumes, the sets, that 
you can't when you have that kind of attention and you have that kind of focus, you can't help but elevate a project that way. Right. And now it's like we're so limited by budgets and things are, you know, you're so limited by just trying to like I'm trying to make the day. I'm trying to not go into 12 hours since I'm going to hit golden hours after that point and kind of keep production budget low that I don't know if we have the same alacrity to, you know, like sometimes when you're in the, the trenches and you're doing those 16 hour days, you know, you just kind of get into like a Zen mindset and you're like, we're all in this together and, and you can fight for it. I mean, that's like that scene in, have you seen Babylon? No, I haven't seen that one yet. It's a great scene in Babylon, you know, uh, the Damien Chazelle movie where it's right before the, the talkie pictures come in and it's just the entire film set and they're all trying to get this final shot and everyone's racing around. They have to go get new camera stock. They have to get it. And then everyone, like Brad Pitt's shooting the shot. He's kind of drunk doing it, but he's still, you know, in, in the motions of it. And everyone is just waiting you know, with bated breath to see if they get it and they get it and everyone cheers and erupts. You know? oh, man. And I've been a part of indie film sets where it is kind of that energy and there's just something to it where, you know, you're like risking it all. You know, like I, the first film that I produced, we did for $35,000 at the time and it ended up, you know, I think back then the whole thing was $55,000. We did 120 pages in nine days in New York City. And it was uh, survival of the fittest uh, chaos the entire time. But that's what made it exciting to do. And like that energy that kind of permeates through through the indie indie film circuit. I, I, I don't know if you have that same love and passion or like all is riding on the, the outcome in some of these major, major tentpole films. No. And you can feel the difference. You're talking about it. And I'm like starting to tear up a little bit. I'm like, yeah. this sounds so beautiful. Cause like there's certain movies, like you say, like the lower budget and, and all that, where you can tell there's so much more passion in it and there's soul put into it and heart. And then you can, you can tell when you're watching movies, like the one I watched last night, there's it's, it just feels soulless. And it feels like, here you go, people, I'm going to force feed you this. We didn't give a shit about the original content. We didn't give a shit about anything. We just want to make money. And you can definitely feel the difference when you're watching. Yeah, the two. Well, it's in general, even with what we have on TV, you know, like, uh, I think that's one of the, the good things about, you know, from my understanding of some of the, the issues going on in the writer strike, it's that shows, you know, like Netflix puts out just so much content. And obviously some shows yeah. do great. You do things, all the shows are doing great. You know, I, I had a buddy of mine who was a lead in um, a show that I... It actually was a fresh voice. It was innovative and creative, but I, I don't think it, I don't think it had any eyes, you know. And that's one of the issues is that they Netflix and those channels they're not releasing the metrics of you know obviously Stranger Things might have had what eighty five million views in the United States, where some of these other shows might get twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand. And if they release those metrics and they see like well this show only had this, then Wall Street starts to pull out. And then it kind of loses funding. And we're kind of like building everything on this pyramid scheme in a way where it's all the money's going in and we can keep investing. And obviously, like the main shows fill, but eventually the bottom is going to kind of cave out and eventually that becomes unsustainable. So that's what, you know, and again, that's also not a great thing either, because you do want the the major stream. You do want the power players in this business, your Netflixes, your HBOs, everything to have original new content. We want to push the envelope as opposed to seeing kind of like the same tropes being done over and over again. But mm -hmm. it just seems right now the public. Because we've been conditioned to kind of gravitates towards what is familiar and, yeah. you know, we associate everything with familiarity. And that's why, obviously, you know, like. Ron Howard says there's only one story and we are probably watching in every movie and every TV show one story, but it's how many twists we can put onto that story. But, uh, you know, I, I would love to get back to pushing the envelope. And uh, yeah. I think that's going to be a bit of a slippery slope. I guess I have to do an intro and introduce you, right? <laughs> we'll do the formalities. For movies to video games, welcome to Marie Plays It All. Today we have a awesome side quest episode and i'm joined by a very special guest i'm super excited super nervous and sweaty to have actor and filmmaker brett lotta with me today thank you so much brett for being here i'm super, I'm super thrilled we've been dancing around this for a couple months so i'm glad we finally we, we finally got to knock it off our, our list 
Yes, I I took a really uh, ballsy uh, leap of faith. You had a question sticker on your Instagram story, and I had a couple cocktails in me, and I was like, "Well, what's the podcast got to do to get a guy like you and a, as a guest?" And you're like, "Oh, just let me know when." And I was like, "What?" All you gotta and then do I is freaked. ask. All we gotta do is ask. All right. So I know you from writing and directing and starring in the Andy Baker tape. I'm going to do a little shameless plug right there. Okay. Andy Baker tape. There we go. Plug it. Um, I am a huge found footage movie. Not, not snob. I just, that's my favorite genre. Horror is my favorite genre. Found footage is my favorite subgenre of movies. I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird, but I have seen close to like a hundred of them. And the Andy Baker tape, I think personally, is one of the, like, I don't know, watching that movie, the production value, the premise, everything is one of the best I've seen. Thank you. I just want to say, and I have watched a couple uh, podcast episodes that you have been on interviews, but I kind of stopped because I wanted to learn the answers that you have on the fly so it's like genuine reaction from me because i'm like no no no, i need to, i need to know so i know i'm, I'm going to ask you some questions that you probably talked to death about i apologize for that my canadian uh, in me is so sorry but <laughs> hope i improve on my last answers you know some of those are my first podcast i felt a little stiff so now i'm trying to you know crack, crack out of my shell a little bit so it's all it's all mud on the wall i know that we kind of basically have a pandemic to thank for the andy baker tape really you know, up, I was an actor out of New York City, and uh, I started producing a little bit in 2018, 2019, and I was shooting some fun little cloning videos in my apartment with an iPhone. So right before the pandemic hit, I did this short film, which did extremely well, it won the Academy Award, and uh, I ended up getting this grant through SAG a little bit right when the pandemic started, and I had nothing to do because the pandemic hit, you know, I'm an out of work actor. So I bought myself a camera. And at the time, my my uh, girlfriend, who also helped produce the Andy Baker tape, was my neighbor in New York City. And she uh, and I were just shooting some fun little short films during the pandemic. And I had a good buddy, Dustin Fontaine from college, who plays Andy Baker in the film. He called me up. and He goes, hey, I want to be in. Let's do something. Let's figure it out. So we kind of wrote a couple shorts and uh, kind of produced it virtually. And one was terrible. <laughs> you know, the next one got a little bit better. And then we decided to make this mockumentary movie. We were going to take a road trip out to Mount Rushmore and kind of go into the heart of America. We had this whole weird story. And then we realized that people at that time were kind of living that. You know, no one really wanted to see like how... The, uh, dark and twisted American life was with the pandemic, with the election, with the polarization of the country. So mm -hmm. we decided to kind of make it a, a little bit more lighthearted. And we we just that's where the idea of the Andy Baker tape came. The truth is, is that we had no money to do this. So we needed to do found footage because we didn't have to have a production staff. I didn't have to have producers. We could basically guerrilla shoot at locations, show up, get in and out, which is how it was a found footage film. And truth is, in life, I'm a big foodie. So we thought that the perfect yeah. get into the story of having the camera constantly rolling was making Jeff a food blogger. And that was one twist that we haven't seen before in found footage. Not that I know mm -hmm. of, you know, and um yeah, you know, it, it kind of just came from this new Instagram culture, TikTok culture, food blogger. And uh, we wrote this with the idea of just to give us a project. You know, we had no idea that we were going to play at a different film festivals, where it was going to go. It was just like, hey, we're bored. You know, he was yeah. in Bloom. I was in New York. What do we do? We did this. And then uh, it, it turned into what it became. <laughs> So did you have to learn how to do stuff since it, since it was just like you uh, and did you have to like learn how to like edit or anything like that? Or did you know how to do all that? Like, did you learn? Uh, some of the stuff I knew how to do, you know, like I used okay. Final Cut for a couple of years and I put together some stuff, uh, not on the level of doing a feature film. So I, I did learn okay. a lot during that process. Uh, the one thing I did learn a lot was color grading. And that was something that, you know, I, I made some mistakes, obviously, and I was doing it out of Final Cut, not Da Vinci. And Da Vinci is considered kind of the, uh, the the industry standard. But for doing a found footage film, I didn't need to make this look like I was shooting Dune. <laughs> I just needed to make it look 
you know, approachable enough. And uh, I did this whole tutorial on color grading. I think I did four different passes of color grading. One of the things in the film that we do a lot is we make it look like there's a lot of single take shots, but there's actually multiple cuts that are put together to compose this single take shot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that was kind of inspired loosely. That was the year of what? It was uh, 1917. I was kind of inspired by watching that and seeing where they would mask shots and learning how to mask properly and do some of these wet pans and hide some of the cuts. That we kind of figured out on the fly. Um, but a lot of it just kind of came out of, you know, it's like necessity is the mother of invention. And how do you tell this story? And how do you, you know, you have to learn on the, like you kind of have an idea and it's like, well, how can I make this work? And instead of like going result oriented, you go, or you start with the result and you work backwards and say, well, if I want this, I can do this, this, and this to get ourselves there. So some of it was just, you know, trial, trial and error. Some of it was an idea of, of storytelling. And, uh, you know, you just kind of throw it in and, and hope for the best. What do you do when you do color grading and how do you mess it, like not mess it up, but like, how do you get it just right? Like what, what is the process for that? I wouldn't I'd say I, I got it right in some things. And so I feel like in some areas, some of the skin looks a little orange, but the truth is it's like good cameras capture a lot of information. They don't necessarily capture it right. I mean, they have the color signs built in, but what your job is in post-production is to pull out the colors that you want and kind of tweak the colors and correct the exposure. Okay. So the first thing in color grading is just making sure that your exposure is hit, that you're not clipping the highs, clipping the lows. I did that the other way, but you know what I mean? Clipping the highs, clipping the lows. What that means is that nothing is underexposed, so your shadows have detail. Nothing's overexposed, so your highlights have detail. Like everyone kind of follows the Ansel Adams chart, the photographer, about like where you should keep your skin tones, your highlights, your midtones. Just kind of neutralizing the exposure of your image first. Then after that, you can kind of put a stylistic twist on it to where like if I want to keep the light at a certain luminance level, I drop that. I also can shift colors a little bit towards like if I want to take some of the chroma and like the bright greens out, I can kind of dial that down, shift that. And some advanced color grading gets into uh, like color theory, like using either like monochrome and some things, or you can use complementary colors or colors, you know, like a common color palette you see in films is teal and orange, since those are the exact opposites on the color wheel. So that kind of like how you're wearing right now, you have a yellow and blue. Yeah. That's, and what it does is that it makes everything pop. You, you don't do it for aesthetic effect. You do it for emotional effect. So the, the mm -hmm. goal of color grading ultimately is to dial in the emotional effect of your story and to also lead the viewer towards certain emotional response. Like for instance, if you have bright red, that's, you know, that's a color of passion, heat, violence that's all associated, you know, darkness is obviously always represents dark brooding under themes, lightness is purity. And if you can find emotional triggers in your scenes, you can also enhance that through the color peer, through the color palette and the images that the uh, that your audience is seeing. I meant to do this, by the way. I knew what I was doing. No, I'm kidding. I did. No, I did. no clue. You came, you um, came prepared. I knew we were going to talk about it. No, uh, maybe that's why I find this movie so comforting. Is it, it's because the tone to me is so like the, the like the color tone to me is so warm and it's my favorite like aesthetic in a movie is like having that because like odd there's so, like, all these autumn scenes in the yeah, movie i'm yeah. just like oh i love it and some of that was kind of happenstance you know like we certainly mm -hmm. though we do the midpoint is where the color palette really kind of changes and the start of this film i know truly like this was never meant to be a horror this is more of a relationship story and mm -hmm. it's really Story about two men bonding, coming together, and they're the yin and yang of each other. You know, they both represent two different sides of the same coin. And, you know, a lot of the stuff in the beginning is certainly uh, by design. Like when we meet Andy, he's at a broken house. When we meet Jeff, he's at this beautiful, you know, floral house, you know, or fl flowing house. And as the story goes and goes, this, the color palette gets darker and darker and darker. One thing we see is that all, all the violence in the film happens at nighttime and it happens during dark times. And during that, the, the color palette, I certainly push things towards like a monochromatic color palette, you know, like black and white, good and evil. And that shows from the midpoint on, like the second that Jeff gets back onto the camera and does the food thing where, hey, I got the Food Network show. Andy, I need you. Where are you? That's where the color palette really shifts to this monochromatic tone and we lose some of the brightness of the beginning because 
the story is only really going one way from there. So I just kind of want to make it feel more and more claustrophobic until we get to the end. That is such an art form. And we don't even, as a viewer, we don't even, re sometimes like, obviously you can kind of notice it, but maybe you don't even realize it's happening, but you're creating that feeling and, oh, that's yeah, awesome. Well, that's a lot of work. This great Sydney Lumet story about filming 12 Angry Men and uh, where the camera starts above, you know, and then throughout the film, it gets lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. And we're shooting up as we see it. And, you know, and it's all subliminal messaging, but it just shows the mm. change of power and the change of dynamic. And listen, like uh, this was trial by fire. And like you can hear these great stories and you can try to emulate that. But like there's no, you know, it's. You learn every time you do. It. So obviously I could have done some things better. And uh, I heard these stories about the greats. I'm like, oh, let me try some of this and see how it works. And I feel like that's the only way to really learn. And I think you have to mm -hmm. be willing to fail. And it's also like failure is such a subjective word that it's it's not, there's no such thing as failure. There's just learning other outlets of, of how to get your desired effect. Like I remember I was watching, you know, even like Lawrence of Arabia and there's this amazing shot when you first see Omar Sharif, like coming across the desert and, you know, it just gets closer and closer to the camera. You have this beautiful backdrop that David Lean sets. So I was like, yeah, let's try a shot like that. So, I mean, Dustin, after leaving this one scene, we had this like, montage of him walking with these like lobster rolls just like that omar sarif shot i was like i was so proud of this metaphor that i could use and it didn't work at all it was just like what are we doing this so it's like you try stuff and you hope that it sticks and if it doesn't it doesn't and then you know you uh you know but i think that is something that i've learned and even the past year or so after i did the film is that go as big as you can you know and it's it's better to take risks and it's better to put yourself out there than you can always rein it and dial it in. But if you start small, it's so much harder to expand. So right. start big, rein yourself in, refine. It's like when you carve a statue out of marble, you're you're not start, you're starting with a big block and you're just chiseling it down. And just because that scene didn't work in this movie, maybe it'll work in your next movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe a shot. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Since I, I watched so many found footage movies, I always think like, what are what are like the challenges in filming found footage as opposed to like just filming like a normal, like a, like a, just a regular type movie as opposed to like a found footage? Like, there's certain things that you have to consider or think about, like well, when you're acting or like to come off like a, like so natural in time or when the way you're filming something to make it seem like oh i'm dropping the camera and i know i'm gonna have to drop it but i have to pretend like you know you know like is there something challenging or like pros and cons about filming found footage in particular yes i mean at the end of the day i think found footage somewhat isolates the acting more and it somewhat really kind of puts a, a lens to are these people earnest? Are they actually delivering real performances? And you can read it because you have a camera in your face constantly. Yeah. And a lot of found footage, I think, is, is the trick about found footage is that there's no cuts. So if I or Dustin and I, if we had a bad moment in a scene, there's not really an area that we can cut to the other person. We're kind of forced to be on camera. So that being said, you really have to be on and you really have to be present and you really have to be working with your scene partner, you know, or, because there's no real editing that I can do to shape a bad moment or a performance. One of the things that we did focus on was even though we can't have cuts, where can we have camera movement? Because camera movement, you know, when you're watching a lot of films, you can create pacing and tone and the dynamic through the cutting, through the way the cameras move. You know, I was just talking to someone about Brian De Palma. And we're talking about that famous shot in Carlito's way, which is like this end tracking shot. And it's just such masterful camera movement. And it's a single shot that goes on for about five or six minutes where Al Pacino's running through Grand Central Station. He's like hiding on a staircase. And it's a single shot. And obviously, you can't just have a stationary camera doing that. You really have choreographed time camera movement. And the same thing goes for found footage, you know, like the, the goal is to make it look like that. It's just spontaneous and you're throwing a camera around and you have this, but it all kind of has to be calculated. So number one, we can know what the story is. We can see the performers 
you know, you can create an element of tension and pacing through the way that the camera moves. And that was mm. the huge for this. Some of it is just dealing with the unexpected too. You know, like on a normal film set, you have security guards everywhere blocking the public off from walking on. And in this, we were truly shooting guerrilla style where it was no holds bar. Uh, we had people yelling stuff at us, you know, which we brought into the film in some parts. You know, it's like we wanted to use outside stimulus. You just have to be open to it. You have to accept that you're probably going to have people on the side. You know, one part we had the police called on us and we had to explain, like, no, we're shooting this this film and the cops. Thought, I mean, they, they all thought it was great. But as long as you're open to the possibilities and you're like, oh, sh someone yelled at me, I got to cut, you know, that's not where the magic happens. The magic happens. It's just like improv 101 where it's like, yes, and, you know, yes, and mm -hmm. let, let's go back with that. Um, I would say in editing the film, some of the, the challenges for me were needing to have certain story elements be part of the story. And to bring those elements in to get us from A, B, C, D to, you know, to the end of the story and not or trying to not feel like it's layered exposition, you know, because exposition is the most boring thing. Some of that was just I mean, this was truly the first feature script that I ever wrote and worked on. So that's a learning curve and it's a learning process. And. You know, uh, and a lot of, I think a lot of screenwriters talk about you can mask exposition through movement. So in some of that, we, we try to just mask that. But, you know, it's all trial and error. And I, I know where I feel like things slow down a little bit. And I wish we were a little bit more concise in moments. But also those are red flags that I have about the movie. And, and everyone's experience can be different with it. Mm -hmm. Having seen it be played with about 40 or 50 audiences. It's amazing where some audiences really, um, you don't feel that lull and some do. And I think that's just kind of, it's kind of dependent on the mood of the audience and the kind of like the collective interest. And, you know, when you have a bunch, when one person starts to laugh, that's become, that becomes contagious. And then the rest of the yeah. theater laughing and you're kind of all in it together. So yeah, it was definitely a, a learning curve. And uh, I, I would like to think I, I gained some perspective after doing it. What do you think you learned the most from making this movie? You know, that's a great question because there were so many things that, that came out of it. It's funny because I, I, I read all the reviews that we have, you know, and, and some people love the movie. Some people absolutely hate it. Uh, but I try to identify some of the spots of what people didn't like. And I think about this more from, I guess I'm kind of centering this around like an acting performance, but in some ways in the beginning, Jeff, I mean, this was intentional. This was what we, we wrote for the character. Jeff is a little bit speaking down to Andy or, mm -hmm. or I wouldn't say directly speaking down, but he's a little bit more flippant towards him and Andy comes off a little bit more vulnerable and in doing so, some viewers, I feel like, lost some empathy with Jeff. So I think that mm. that's us in that, like, you know, that's... And, and we did try to throw in a save the cat moment. Like, save the cat is when your, your your lead character, like, your main character does something really kind. So it's like, oh, he is a good guy, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to have moments to where your audience just completely sets in with the character they're really supposed to follow. And you need to find ways to really bridge that gap and just connect the audience to your lead because at the end of the day, they're the person taking you through that story. And if you can't identify with that person, you probably won't identify with the film. You know, with some people, that aspect, I think, was complete. You know, some people absolutely identify with Jeff and they understood him and went through. And mm -hmm. for others where they saw Jeff being a little bit more glib and condescending, that uh didn't set right. So I, I learned that uh, you really, really have to have a, a likable lead th throughout, throughout, throughout your, uh, your film. Yeah. And that, that's kind of subjective too, yeah. really. Well, it because I mean, it's all subjective. Yeah. Listen, you're never, yeah. you're never going to appease everyone. And that's something never. that you have to do. And at the end of the day, it's like, we can say all this stuff and I can do them my next film. And then that can totally flop too. And it's just like acting. And it's just like performance where it's like, 
you know, it's potato, it's tomato, tomato. And you, people like different things and like sensibilities. And at the end of the day, all you can do is do what's true to you and tell a story that mm -hmm. is inside of you. And if I am able to get out in the final product the stuff that's in my head, the stuff that's in my heart that I want to say to people, then I did my job. At the, you know, one of the things that I've heard recently, it's like, what anyone else thinks of me is none of my business. And I, yeah. and it's hard because, you know, obviously we're not doing this to be played in a vacuum of a closed bubble of my apartment where I'm watching the movie and being like, oh, I, I got the moment right. You know, I, you want an audience to read it. Well, you want an audience to receive what you're doing, but you're never going to be everybody's cup of tea. And that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the things uh, about art. So Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of have, I mean, I, I, at first when I was getting like, cause we, 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 I have to say we did get some great reviews and, you know, there were some that came out that I definitely kind of left and I was like, oh man, that kind of stings a little bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, they say you can't read the good reviews without reading the bad reviews. And, uh, it's true, you know, and I, and I mean, now it doesn't really bother me and I've kind of come to terms with some of it but you still at the end of the day like you want your you know it's like your kid you want it to go out there and and be yeah. and loved by all <laughs> it's true it's like what it's my baby what they say about you what <laughs> yeah and so it's like yeah. you know, like i have like empathy you know it's like i you know in theater there's always that rule where you, it's called like the six block rule where you don't say anything about a show until you're six blocks away and it's true it's like even if films that i i'm not a fan of i have a harder time criticizing because i know behind like at at the end of the tunnel there's someone that poured their soul into this even if it's not yeah. a well received product you know but they tried and they put their best into there and uh you have to have some kind of empathy for the artist you know but you know this this world this this art form the art form of movies it's like social darwinism so you kind of have to you have to learn what's going to be best and then keep developing that voice very well said. Am I challenging you? I remember you were like, hey, challenge me. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on my toes right now. All right. I'm, I'm on my tippy toe. I, I'm curious to know that you've done like everything, the acting and the writing, the directing, the editing and all that. What's the most challenging and what are you most passionate about doing? The acting or the writing or the directing? Uh, well, writing, I think, is the most challenging thing for a lot of mm -hmm. people. I would say I'm most bad. I mean, I'm an actor first and, and I, I love acting and everything came from me out of acting. Um, and learning acting and having great mentors and storytelling only kind of helps you tell stories better. I would still say there's parts of acting that are so, I mean, even last, I mean, I'm in constant classes. I was taking a class last night. I was working on some things that are a bit of a blind spot to me that, that I don't like to do. But the truth is expanding on your blind spots only helps your strengths become a little bit better. And I was working on something and I was getting really frustrated. And I have a great mentor out here, a great teacher, John Rosenfeld was really pushing me towards expanding and, and dialing in. I was getting really frustrated. And it's true. It's a, it's a reminder in acting that you kind of always have to be constantly expanding and that there is no plateau. There is no, there is no peak of the mountain. You can always tell a story deeper. You can always tell a story more effective. But we kind of get a little bit of, I don't want to use the word artistic ego, but once you kind of feel like you have some understanding, sometimes it's harder for the person to grow. But the truth is you can always grow. You can always get better. And uh, that's challenging because sometimes you have to look at the stuff that you're good at, that you are like, I can do this. And then also realize that it's your crutch. And how do we really find the truth underneath that? And how do we go deeper into those things? So that's a constant journey in acting. I, I love editing, you know, and editing is subjective, but editing is so much fun because it's like you're putting a piece of a puzzle together. And I originally got, I would say, involved in acting. It's because I love movies. I see every movie I can, and I really appreciate moving image, moving story. I guess selfishly in Andy Baker tape, through some of the editing, you can make yourself look better. You can make your performance read better. So that that, that is fun. But it's also figuring out the puzzle. Editing is a challenge, though, too, because, again, you, when you edit, you're in a vacuum. There's no one else around you. There's no one else to read the pacing. And it's like, oh, I think this pacing works. But until you show someone else, until you have live feedback, you don't really know. And my sensibilities are different than your sensibilities and someone else's sensibilities. But when I had my first cut of Andy, you know, I thought I had a lot of stuff dialed in pretty tight. I think it was an hour and 24 minutes. And I showed it to my uh, my producer, Caitlin, who worked on the film, Caitlin Bork. And uh, 
she basically came back with like 15 minutes that I could cut and she was 100%. Mm. And, but that's why you have to work in teams. That's why like nothing can exist in a vacuum. You have to have other, you have to have people to bounce ideas off of and people that you trust. You can't, and like, again, you can't take every opinion to heart and be like, oh yes, they're right. I was wrong. You have to have some sort of artistic integrity, but also be humble enough to accept the fact that someone else might see something that 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 you're missing. Writing is probably for me and not for everyone is the hardest part. And the hardest thing about writing is just sitting down and opening up your computer and just typing for an hour, an hour and a half. I think because I'm directing the things that I'm writing, you fall into the trap of writing for a result and being like, well, I want this effect. How do I write this? And then you tend to censor yourself and self-edit. And like anything, I think it just has to be a purge in the beginning where you just purge out everything. You just throw it on paper. Then you can go back and shape. That's something that I run into a little bit of struggle with. It's because I'll like rewrite a scene three or four times, try to make it perfect. There's no such thing as perfect. Instead of like, just moving on to the next and throwing stuff out. And uh, I find that to be, I, I hesitate to use the word tedious because when you're in a good writing flow, you're flowing, you know, and you're, you know, there's this great book called Zen and the Art of Archery. And it just kind of talks about finally hitting, hitting those Zen elements where it's a full mind body connection and you're going. And, you know, it's not an athletic thing. I mean, acting, I think a lot of the things relate to like acting, writing, filmmaking, moment to moment behavior and being in a state of creative flow, which is very much like being an athlete in the state of like, a, you know, the state of like Tom Brady, for instance, is working from a Zen place. And the goal is to get into that Zen place, to get into that creative element. And sometimes you're there and sometimes you're not. You can't mm-hmm. force when you're not. And you also can't expect yourself to be in that all the time but when things click they click and it's both of the hemispheres of your brain working together and things just seem to come out of you so yeah i could imagine just not feeling like in a create like not having the creative energy to write but you know you have to write but you feel like you're forced to write it's like well if i write now it's going to be from my heart i'm going to be passionate about what i write like i could see how writing would be like yeah a, a i mean struggle I, I at times it, I, in New York talk about are you in or are you out and that was an exercise that she would give and being in means having you know it's like you're flowing you're feeling good when you're out it's coming from a place of judgment and like you know someone just talked at you and you're like fuck this person sorry I cursed but you know it's just like and then that's kind of like a negative mind space and then that kind of goes the truth is is that you're really in your lowest energy vibration when you're like that when you're angry when you're pissed and so the exercise would be like to call yourself like I'm out right or just like I'm out, you know, and then you then that will help you go back to being in. Her thing was we should never create from a place of being out. You want to create from a place mm. of being. So even if you're not in, what can you do to get in? And one of her big things was having like a new song every other month or something that elevates your vibration that it's like, you know what, I can forget some of the the, the nonsense that's in my head. I'll push that out. I'm in a state of creativity. Let, 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 let me start from here. But if you start from a place of judgment, if you start from a place of, I don't want to use like resent, but if you start from a place of like, I don't want to do this right now, you're not going to do it, you know? No. You're just, and you have to find the joy and the, and the discipline. And I think that that's something that all athletes and artists agree on is that motivation comes and goes. And I could wake up one day and be motivated, wake up the next day and not be motivated. But the difference is discipline. And a disciplined person, no matter what they're feeling, will find that. What does Mike Tyson say? It's like discipline is to do something like you love it, even when you don't. And that mm-hmm. is the trick, I think, to uh, you know putting your 10,000 hours in as an actor, as a writer, as a director, anything is to just show up. And use all your uh, facilitations and, uh, you know, just just commit to the task in front of you. I'm going to write a couple things down that you're saying because I'm like inspired by so many things that you're saying. <laughs> I need to write this in and out thing. 
Yeah, that was always a good lesson. And it's it's like even like yesterday, I taped something Sunday night. I was out for most of the time. I was working in this class yesterday. I was out for a lot of that. You know, I wasn't really thriving in like my best self. And it's true. It's like, you know, I, I know these things and I know, but it's you have to show you have to practice what you preach and you have to show up for yourself. And it's easy not to, and especially now. You know, it's like, I think everyone is feeling some kind of like collective, what the fuck are we doing with all these strikes and things going on? And, you know, about five or six months of just kind of like this, I don't want to use, I mean, it is, it's like a limbo, you know, it's like your kind of life and things are put on hold. And it's one of the things that I talked about, because we do this, like I, I'm in this acting group and everyone kind of talks about check-ins. And it's true. It's like, I, I feel like when you're busy and you have a lot of stuff going on, it's easy. It's easy to show up for yourself. It's easy to go to bed at 11 o'clock, wake up at seven, go to the gym, cook, cook well for yourself and do these things. But then you're also relying on outside stimulus to be like, you have to do it this way, you know? And what's hard is to show up for yourself when things aren't going great. And when things are kind of in a, in flux and to have the belief, to have the faith, to have the discipline to show up and put your best foot forward, even when you're not getting direct results. And um, mm. that's something that everyone as an artist, I think, struggles with. It's because, you know, we don't just do it to be creative for ourselves. In some way, I, I don't know. I don't I can't believe that we don't I, that everyone, you know, it's like we kind of we, we want some sort of applause. And that's part of it. It's like, that's mm -hmm. why you do these things. That it's not just like we're existing in this vacuum where it's like, I am, you know, the impassioned artist. You, you want some kind of reciprocity for the stuff that you're putting out there. And for the past five or six months, no one's got that, you know? And how do you still show up with the same passion and the same daringness that you did, you know, when there's no guarantee of an outcome? I want to talk to you about uh, the writer strike and stuff, because I know you post about that on your Instagram story. Sometimes you post things on your Instagram story that I think are jokes and I'll be like, ah, oh, this is a joke. And you're like, no, nah, this is really happening. I'm like, okay. For people who don't know like what's really going on with the writer strike, like what is, what was really happening? Well, the truth is, is that, I mean, it's, there's so many different things, but uh mm -hmm. I think the writer's biggest gripe is, and rightfully so, and same with actors, is residual payments and putting in work and also fear of AI because this, like, just for brass tacks, living in New York and living in Los Angeles is obscenely expensive, you know, and you have to make so many sacrifices that my friends that are not living in cities like this, like, they are all you know, can afford houses, buy houses. I think some of the, you know, it's like even like the homeowners association fees on some condos I were looking at are $1,400 on top of what you're paying. It's just insane. So the cost of living here is insane. Your daily groceries are more expensive. Your cost of living is more expensive. And what was happening with writers is that, you know, the fear of AI threat coming in is just taking these writers rooms where they used to have, you know, eight or 10 writers and just completely condensing it to where you could just have one showrunner giving prompts to, you know, an AI program. And this is not happening yet, but this is what could happen. And mm -hmm. you're basically eliminating the need for, for support staff. And, you know, AI is not at the level now that it's going to talk from human perspective and have like the deepest understanding of uh, what, what a human struggle with. But, it, you know, it could potentially reach that level of being able to emulate that in five, 10 years. So that's just part of the issue. The other part of the issue is just residuals and the payment from residuals where streaming services do not pay the same residuals that cable network does or, or, or films. I think it was the writers of Suits. They had the most stream show on Netflix recently and they made $3,000 from that, which is insane. So these corporations are taking massive, massive profits. And I don't want to misquote some of this since I, I, I don't know if these are all the facts, but it, it's somewhere along those lines. And what was kind of a necessity for this business to stay afloat of having teams that people work on is slowly being kind of pushed away. So I think the writers were, I think that's one of the main things about the writer strikes and just having proper compensation. But the fact that some, you know, like writers on major shows 
are living off food stamps that are working where some of the corporate, some of like the, the, the major studios are making so much money off the backs of the labor. It's basically labor exploitation, which is one of the big things. You know, it's like acting, writing, everything. It's like nice work if you can get it. But let's be honest that a lot of these jobs are extremely competitive and extremely difficult to come by. And even if you're staffed on one of those shows, you may write for the first season, you may make $40,000, $60,000 for six months. But living in the city, you know, it's like now with the call, with the price of inflation, you might not get your next job for another year and a half. And that money, and after taxes and agent fees and everything, like that's all factored in, you're left with just scrounging to get by. And yeah. I think we're really just fighting for survival. And that's one of the things that I know actors are fighting for. And I've seen my residuals that I get from some network shows compared to what I got from streamers. And years ago, you know, even even now, it's like I, I've been taking a bunch of side jobs just to get by. The My expenses out here are astronomical. And I need some kind of money to get by during this time. Maybe 20 years ago, you could come to L.A., live in a nice one bedroom for, you know, 600 700 $800. If you booked three guest stars a year. You get the residuals back from that and you could survive and focus on your craft, focus on the work, focus on classes and expanding without having to, to give all of your time to other side jobs and other focuses. And that's one of the hardest things that I've dealt with as a professional actor. It's when you have to you have to put bread on the table. You have to survive when you're not working and you're not working all the time. And I would love the opportunity to to be, uh, you know, to, to, I mean, and I have, I mean, there's times where I, I have been fully working, you know, where I'm not working side jobs, but then there's also times when you're forced to work a side job. And also it's just, you're working 40 hours a week on one thing, 40 hours a week on something else. And it, uh, is not easy. And sure. I think every person can identify with the fact that we're all kind of overworked. We're all kind of feeling this way, but if, what is going on in the writers and the actors is not just symbolic of artists, it's symbolic of the entire country and the state of what everyone is feeling to where we're all struggling to, you know, get by financially. We're all kind of seeing the ex like the fruits of our labor go up, you know, to go up and go away from us. And Unless there's some kind of collective consciousness that comes together and says, we're all part of this together. And this isn't just tangential to actors and writers and people in Hollywood. It's across the country. We need to reevaluate how we are living as a society because the things that I the things that I grew up on and the way that my parents raised me 30 years ago, it's it's almost impossible for people this age to do in the same way. And uh, I think we're really just fighting for for survival. But why? Like, why is this happening? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's all there's okay. all different theories on what's going on, and I, I don't want to talk on it too much. But you know, it it in some ways I can't help but think some of it's all by somewhat of design to kind of keep people on this perpetual cycle, and we're kind of tethered to a system where. You know, you have to keep paying bills and you have to keep paying your taxes like that. And it seems like it's just getting tougher and tougher. I had this conversation with my father recently because I was certainly feeling some of the stress about this. I think that everyone at certain times has felt this, like during the Vietnam War, everyone was kind of feeling mm -hmm. this kind of pressure, you know, and throughout, obviously, like during the missionary times, everyone was feeling these mm -hmm. crazy pressures. So I don't, obviously, we're not the only generation that's feeling this way. but it is an unfortunate byproduct of capitalism. There is always going to be a group of workers, and that's also part of a society for people that really kind of keep things moving and afloat that aren't that aren't necessarily rewarded for the efforts of their labor. And I, I, I mean, I'm not a political, you know, theorist. I, I don't know what the right answer is, but from when I was a kid until now, I have to say that I see the tensions and I see people more despondent than I've I've ever before, than I ever have before. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I collectively don't want to see that for people. I don't want to see it for myself. I don't want to see that for my friends. I don't want to see that for people that are trying to start off and having kids and families mm -hmm. and not being able to be home and, you know, spend time with their children since they have to work three different side jobs in order to float their families. But mm -hmm. 
you know, unless it's a, a Hunger Game style revolution. I don't know what really we can do about it. So the world's going to keep on spinning. We have to find ways to to work under the systems that we're in. And um, that's, I think, everyone's challenge is, is how can we maintain our own sense of composure? How can we maintain our own sense of priority and dignity and not let all the extra noise permeate us and distract us and keep us feeling down because that's the same concept of we talked about of like in and out with if mm -hmm. you're constantly burdened with and you're constantly feeling stressed about finances and this you're going to operate from your lowest energies you know it's like they call that your reptile mind where it's like you're in your low chakras and you're kind of operating from this kind of stance of well everything is not good and then that becomes a self-fulfilling cycle and we start kind of having these self-fulfilling prophecies where it's like, well, everything is just shit. It's going to be shit. And that's the danger of what's going on now is that a lot of people, I think, are operating under that. We kind of pretend that we're not. And we want to get into our, our higher levels of thinking, our higher vi levels of love and vibration and, you know, connection and community. And um, mm. I think that, I mean, that's ultimately what acting and storytelling was about it was about community it was about creating a universal shared experience that you and i can walk away from and bond over and have a sense mm. of we were just part of something i saw myself there you saw yourself there how can we be a better version of ourselves how can we take the lessons that we learned from the piece of theater that we saw from the film that we saw and apply it to our apply it to our to, or to our own life which is why during this time when everyone is feeling this pressure and the stress we need, you know, you need good stories. You need good artists. You need things to empathize with. You need to see yourself. You need to see your reflection out there so so, so you know that you're not alone. And I don't think we're going to get that with any AI writing movies. <laughs> no, we're not. And, you know, no. again, that's, it's you, what you can't, no matter what, I, and especially now, like AI, from my understanding, it's not fully it's not writing it's just sourcing from other people's content so it's taking mm -hmm. 50 different screenplays that are all under the same kind of theme and putting an idea together based on that look at like the guys like Hemingway you know Bukowski these guys these were withered people that lived life and yeah. all you know like Cormac McCarthy the guys that write stories that I like these are people that experience the ups and downs the the levels of depression the levels of euphoria the drinking, the drugs, the crazy sex. These people are, they just have experiences that you can't get until you live life. And that's mm -hmm. the same thing about artists, directors, everything. It's like, sometimes you just can't create until you've had some experiences. And AI is never going to have those experiences. It's never, it's never, gonna, it's never going to feel, uh, you know, the pains of a heartbreak. It's never going to feel mm -hmm. the, the the you know the euphoria of being in love of, of real connection you know it, it can write down it could, it could give you it could give a, a generalized feeling of that but it, it doesn't yet know what those experiences actually feel like do you think there's anything anything at all positive that could come from ai doing these things yeah, anything I, listen we have to again you know you have to be open to anything because we have to evolve with the technology that's being put out there. And, you know, I have some great friends that are writers and they talk about this AI program where it's like, you know, I could say to an AI program, I, I want to write this. How do I turn this into an Oscar worthy film? And it'll give like a generalized thing about like, you know, story points and you can kind of find like your basic needs. And it, there really aren't to the level of what a great writer's writing right now, but it is a concept and an idea. So you can start to like map out your premise points and base around that way much quicker mm -hmm. than it would. Some of these things might take you 48 hours on your own. And now I program you that in 20 minutes. So in this okay. day, and time is a necessity. So yes, you can use things for your time. But, you know, I, again, nothing's ever going to be the same. It's always going to be different. And I think the fear for actors more so too is we're kind of hitting this like quantum computing is not a thing yet but when quantum computing becomes <laughs> a thing and we actually are able to project images in real time using an ai program where you could have 
you know, someone with the looks of Megan Fox, but the emotional availability of Meryl Streep that, you know, tells this story. That's something that could potentially, you know, you, it's like, what was that movie that Pacino did? Uh, was it S Simone, where they create the AI movie star, the perfect movie star? This was like a 2000 mm -hmm. movie. And you could, you could do that, you know? You might be able to do that in 20 years. And, you know, what took people like Al Pacino a lifetime to get to their, their craft and studying and understanding, you know, I think like Jack Nicholson's famous quote is to be an actor, you have to breathe out of your asshole. But what he means is that you have to be so in touch with every part of your body. You have to know your bullshit. You have to know your patterns. You have to know how you normally express things. You have to know your points of view, how to subvert your points of view, what baggage you bring into a character, what, you know, what intrinsic properties that I bring to someone and that's different from the character, all these things. And you can't learn that in a year. You can't learn that in two years. You can't unlearn behavioral patterns that have been part of you since you've been a kid. It's a lifetime journey. <laughs> and this is not just for actors. This is for anyone that has reached a pinnacle of their craft, you know, whether it's a plumber, whether it's someone driving, uh, you know, ferry boats. Obviously, they've amassed a life lesson to do that job the way that they do it, where an AI program might not have to go through that 20 years of training. So, yes, for the people that are in control, great, they can use that. My question is, though, is that there's so many people that are employed, you know, that are based on their skill and craft. Who pays the taxes to the government? You know, who's going to pay the taxes when all the writers, when all the set designers, when your quantum computing films, when you are having, you know, AI generated movies fully without the Teamsters driving people to to and from sets, the craft food services, the script supervisors, the, you know, the, the businesses across the street that flourish from the truck drivers who get a cup of coffee in between. I mean, that's what a lot in, in New York. A lot of those, I mean, by the studios, there's so many little places that just the workers go to get lunch at. They're all out of business then if you have that. Who's paying the taxes to the government on top of that? And it's not just acting we're talking about. We're talking about, like, you know, if there's self-driving cars. We're talking about, you know, I think the number one employment for men in this country is truck driving. And they're talking about having self-driving 18-wheelers. So yeah. who pays the taxes when 250000 you know, truck drivers are out of work with self-driving cars. So there has to be some sort of government intervention about this because it's going to be lose-lose for everyone. I can't imagine that some of this isn't conscious in moving forward with government regulations on AI and, and uh, you know, the potential of it taking like 60% of jobs in this country in the next 25 years, which is, yeah. that was a number that was thrown out. So you're you kind of open Pandora's box. And yeah. until there's some kind of lid that's put on that box, who really knows what's gonna who knows yeah. what's gonna, <laughs> who I don't knows? want to get more of it or dark, but I, I don't really have the answer to it all. Terminator judgment day, man. It's coming. Like seriously, I don't know what else to that's say. Like Skynet, great. Right? lose no. lose. Oh, Starlink is Skynet. I just watched the video on that. You know, all these like restaurants, like there's this bar in Las Vegas right now that is solely it's robots that are mixing your drinks that are pouring oh, stuff. Oh, no. And like that's part of the reason of why you go to, again, we're talking about community. We're talking about society. Mm. Part of the reason going to a bar is sometimes just to talk to the bartenders, to talk to people around you, to have an in-person experience. And we're getting farther and farther away from real in-person experiences. And it's it's amazing to me because I'm in, you know, I spent about 12 years on and off in New York City and I'm in LA, right? And I was it was certainly a big shift when I moved here, because in New York City, you have the great equalizer and you're on the subway and you are forced to be with people constantly. You are forced to work with someone like to sit on a train directly across from someone who you may never be a part of. And uh, you kind of have to create your own harmony in there. where L.A. is a much more polarizing city. You're in your car all the time. You're not walking down the street to places. And I certainly felt a little bit more isolated out here. And I have a lot of friends here. I have a lot of friends from the East Coast that came out here, but it was certainly an isolating feeling. And, you know, I've met plenty of people organically here, 
but a lot of dating out here is all through dating apps and it's that oh, man. didn't exist you know as we were meeting people and you're forced to go up on your own you know on your own merit and uh, have an actual in person conversation and talk to someone that way and you know i can't help but think like between that and the amount of stimulus you can find on the internet you know for lack of a better word it's we are opening i mean it's like we are completely taking away in some ways the the barrier of admission and like having to kind of develop yourself and become a better version of yourself to meet people mm-hmm. and that's where like technology while in some ways it's more convenient it makes you less human and it kind of takes away from you know, because even though we can pretend in life, there is no real consolation prize. You know, you kind of have to, if you really want to get ahead, you, you really have to to be the best version of yourself in, in anything that it is and find ways that you can constantly improve and, and constantly get better. So I, uh, some technology, while it serves a purpose, a lot of technology, I feel like is kind of making us into uh you know, the people from Wally, and we're not there yet, but it, it, who knows what the next 200 years is going to be like. I use that every time, like it's turning into Wally, man. Again, yeah. that, it's going to be Wally. I say that so often. It's so true. And like you're saying, with like the dating stuff and everything, it's not even like dehumanizing to yourself, but it's like, it's your, the people, people you're going to meet is your dehumanizing not intentionally but it's like i just swipe on this person it's yeah, not even a person yeah, anymore it's a picture yeah. that's all that's all the people are and like they could have yeah. like a, a a wonderful soul they could be like the best person but he's like Meh, and it, that's all it is it's like it, again it's, it's like a product it's things have become completely transactional and we've kind yeah. of lost the magic in some ways of like living in you know like mm-hmm. of living in a, and like the you know I, I was talking to someone about this too where it's you know, like if you were growing up in a small town in the 1950s, you're dating pools directly what's around you. And you might not have even seen people from different dating pools where now it's apps like Instagram, these dating apps is that you're just exposed to thousands of people. You go on Instagram, you're exposed to thousands of people from around the world. You know, some of the most stunning people you've ever seen. And who knows if they're actually a real representation of themselves or not. (laughs) What's going on up here in your sense of comparison to like, oh, I don't know if, you know, why would I settle for this when I could see this somewhere else? And it's again, it's Pandora's box. We're just opening up the the possibilities of things. And um, you know, in some ways, I think ignorance is bliss. And yeah, you don't, oh yeah. Ignorance can be bliss. And once you pull back the curtain on some of this and you kind of see what's going on, you can never actually go back to when you were. I don't want to say the naive, word, but, but less, but more pure. You know, I think that yes. that's what we're kind of missing is like this sense of this sense of purity that I mean, I it, yeah, that you know, like I, I look back at even being like fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen, and of course, like your ideas change when you enter the world. You know, once you kind of get away from your parents and you get away from your hometown and you're out there, everything changes and evolves. But there is something to be said about the sense of excitement and the sense of purity. And you do have to keep some of that, that excitement alive inside of you. And what we're talking about earlier, it's like, there's so many things outside to kind of detract from that and and to make you to be like, oh, this is bad and this is bad, but you have to keep that fire going because, and not to sound corny, but it's like, not everything is bad. You know, let's Mm -hmm. be uh, that's true. And like I, I and I I hope that I'm not coming off as as negative because I, I don't believe that, but we there there is still there's great people out there, there's great things and there's great experiences to still be had. But you have to believe that's gonna come for you. You know, if if you lead with everything is bad, dating is bad, this is bad, this is bad, it's yeah. it's self fulfilling prophecy. You are not coming across as negative at all. Um Honestly, I find it inspiring because I can definitely, I find it so easy to get stuck in that negative mindset because like you say, once that curtain's pulled and you're exposed to things and you understand things and you realize that like purity innocence is like gone and it's so hard to 
Cause like the last like four years, I'm I like that curtain was pulled back for me. And I'm like, no, everything's a, agenda, everything suck. And I get into that so yeah. deep. So I'm like, hey, I'm writing down this in and out thing right now. Cause I need to use this. I really need to use it. It's inspiring. You're not being negative. I, I do, yeah. I mean, it's it's so easy to get on these rabbit holes of like there's agendas and we're being pushed into stuff, but it's yeah. <laughs> what I I stand by what I said before is that like the world keeps spinning no matter what. And yeah, you only have your own personal power and you only have at the end of the day your own way of processing what's going on around you and how you maintain your own personal power and how you are able to deal with adversity and that's that's your only way forward you know until there's like an absolute collective effort where everyone is kind of pushing for some kind of change and pushing for something which is not probably ever going to fully happen you have to find the you have to find meaning you have to find the empathy you have to find all those things for yourself because no one else is mm. going to find that for you that's right and i think sometimes that's lacking in people today is the empathy and also just like understanding yeah. just no yeah i mean empathy know? and it's true it's like you know, I, and I probably, if I was 18 hearing myself talk, I would have been like, shut the fuck up. What are you talking about? <laughs> but it is true. And I'm, it's not like I'm walking around like some saint, like someone drove past me and honked when I was pulling out of a spot. And I like was so mad in the car, like smashing the thing, you know, and it's like we we all it's all so easy to to not have empathy. And I think that that is like. You know, they say, and I, I am someone that struggles with this, but someone was saying that practicing gratitude is the is the way that you can kind of keep yourself grounded and happy. And uh, it's it's hard sometimes. You know, practicing true gratitude is hard. I struggle with that. But then I look at, you know, I'm able to be on a podcast with you talking about movies and talking about my life and with some of the atrocities that are going on in the world right now. Anyone who wants, so I, I have to look at from a place of gratitude that I'm able to do this mm -hmm. because, and again, I'm speaking from some places of privilege. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely, I'm speaking from some places of privilege, and, and I am aware of that. But then, like, you see so much around you where it's like, oh, I want, I mean, I, especially living in LA, I look up, I walk outside my apartment, I have the Hollywood Hills behind me, I see all these mansions up there. You're constantly, you're like, well, I want to live up there, you know? It's like the yeah. grass is always greener. And I'm reading, I, I read a lot of Robert Greene. I really like Robert Greene and I'm reading this book that he has. And that's one of the passages that I'm on right now where it's no matter what, no matter where you are, someone always has a better, there's always a bigger fish. There's always something. And you can fall into the trap of never feeling like you have enough. And that's part of what consumerism is. That's part of what capitalism is. That's part of everything that we're experiencing right now or you can look around and realize that you have everything you need it's harder when you know we live in states of comparison and like you're constantly comparing yeah. yourself and that was i mean i remember reading like 20 22 in new york city my first year there i, I probably had i don't know two thousand dollars to my name and i was you're walking down fifth avenue constantly and you're looking at a Bugatti pull up and someone going to shop at the Brioni suit store to buy a $9,000 suit. And then you have, uh, you know, the, the Plaza hotel right there and you see just the way and you're like, it's, and you're constantly looking up in New York at skyscrapers. So it's like, you're always looking up to something better and it's hard not to compare. And it takes a little bit of time to realize that everyone is feeling like they're lacking something. Everyone is yeah. feeling like that. It's going to be the next thing that completes them. And mm -hmm. that's what a lot of like the podcasts, the authors that I write is that the only thing that really completes you is your sense of self and the power that you bring to yourself and nothing external can actually do that, which is hard because, yeah, I mean, a billion dollars, I'd feel much more complete than I do now. But, you know, I, I have to make do with I have to make do with everything that, that I have at my disposal. OK, Robert Greene, is that what you said? Yeah, you said? yeah, Robert Greene. He wrote like 48 Laws of Power. I'm reading the okay. day right now, but I, I really like Robert Greene. All right. I'm see, I, you're teaching me so much. I'm getting teary eyed. I feel like this is like the most inspirational conversation I've had in months. I'm not trying. I mean, I'm, I'm honestly more speaking to myself than I am to you right now, because it's stuff that I have to remind myself constantly, because 
it, it's hard, you know, it's, it's, it's it, uh, you know, it's not easy for anyone out there. And I came from a place of, I was a very high level swimmer for a long time. I had some great coaches, uh, who were unrelenting and, you know, like you showing up for yourself. And there was mm-hmm. plenty of times, even when I was swimming that I did not show up for myself. Uh, same times in acting in life that I did not show up for myself. And at the end of the day, nobody ever comes to rescue you. And you mm-hmm. have to you have to start showing up for yourself because there you are your own your your own best your your own best hope. I feel like we've had some like David Goggins quotes in here today too. Like you just like, it's like no one's coming to oh, save God, you. Like, we, we, we need it's people. true. You need people yeah. like uh, because. He's right. You know, like, I, I'm not going to go run 70 miles a day like David Goggins. But, you know, <laughs> when I am feeling lazy, like tonight, like I've been running around all morning. I'm doing this podcast. I got a doctor's appointment later. I just kind of I, I bought a new plant stand I want to set up right now. The last thing I want to do is go to the gym tonight. I want to take a night off and read. But I know if I don't do that, then I'll like feel guilty. But I'll feel so much better after doing, it, you know, yes. and that's. You have the voices of like your David Goggins. You have all these people that are like <laughs> inside your head and you're like, well, if they can do it, so can I, you know? And uh, again, like that's what we talked about earlier where it's like motivation is yep. one thing. Discipline is something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone with discipline will outwork someone with motivation anytime. I, I know you're saying that you're saying this like for yourself, and, but honestly, er, everyone can relate to what you're saying. and. I'm going to have that Brett lot of voice in my head now. <laughs> Screw David Goggins. You're going to be in there and being like, come on, you got to show up for yourself. Come on. you can do." Well, good, good, good. If you got one from this podcast, I, I hope it's that. This has been so deep. I like, and I, I love that. It's been so intense and deep this conversation. And I have been taking up your time and I feel guilty. Not at all. Not at all. I, I'm, I'm having a great time talking. I have a couple um, questions on the lighter side for you. Before I have to let you go, well, this isn't really a, a lighter side question. So I'm very, very curious as to what if what is your favorite movie, but then what is the movie that inspired you the most to like be to get into like acting and stuff. So favorite and inspirational are different. Yeah, you know this goes back and forth. I would probably mm-hmm. say One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is my favorite movie. Um, mm. Same. I'm a big Jack Nicholson fan. Sometimes I say five easy pieces, which is also early Jack Nicholson, because it really kind of shows a portrait of a man who keeps running away from himself. And I think that that's something that we can identify with a lot. But but Cuckoo's Nest, especially what we're talking about now, I mean, it, it's a universal, but he does more for those people in there. But he's an outlier. He's outside the box. And for all these outside the box thinkers, society in some ways wants to neuter and lobotomize you, you know, and it is uh, not a horror film, but that ending is, it is so impactful and so devastating that what happens to McMurphy by the end of that movie, you know, and uh, it's just, a, it's a masterpiece, one of the greatest films ever made, and he is performance, that's great. When I was younger in high school, I, I guess I go back between two that really inspired me a lot. Again, Jack Nicholson. I love as good as it gets. For some reason, when I was 17 years, 16 mm-hmm. years old, I was I was identifying with Melvin Udall, which was a 60 year old man in New York with severe ADHD. So I don't know where that came from. Yeah. But, uh, I think, again, it was just Jack Nicholson. Um, what he brings to a character as far as like a troubled man battling with the demons inside of himself yet trying to be the best version of himself and i think that that's kind of what we see in that movie too and it ends on a on a very high note you know jack jack is mm-hmm. great and you know i know everyone says this but i saw this movie before it became the movie to be like oh i love this movie it's a cult classic i love eternal sunshine of the spotless mind i remember the first time watching that love story that and this is why you know we this is why we go to the movies is to watch movies that we I, I remember thinking I mean I'm I'm getting thrown off track but like thinking that if they don't get together there's no point for anything 
And again, like it was such a feeling of like why we see great stories because you want, you are rooting. This story is inside of you. You're feeling the pains that this guy is feeling. You're feeling the pains that Kate Winslet's feeling. You just are about to rip your TV apart. I remember like watching the part at the end of that movie. I don't know if you're familiar with it. When they're on the beach in Montauk and you know it's the last night they're going to be together. And the next morning they're going to wake up and be erased from each other completely. And it's, it's everything that a movie should be. John Bryan did this sound, the, the score for that movie. And they're like these little minute clips. The song that plays when they're saying goodbye on the beach. And she says, meet me in Montauk. Like you cannot watch that and not well up and not be like, yeah. there is love in this world. Like even like talking about it, it makes yeah. me kind of emotional that like. I'm willing there, up. I'm willing up now. Yeah. That there is like something outside of us of a greater power and like the power of human connection and that's what that movie really shows you know and like that's what mm-hmm. all great love stories show and you know it's just mm-hmm. the cinematography the acting i remember watching jim carrey talk about that movie when he just says um you're no good to anyone unless you've had your balls busted to do a script like this i think that was right after him and jenny mccartney jenny mccartney you know, they they broke up you know i love jim i mean man on the moon is another one of my favorite movies the story of Jim Par- Jim Carrey playing Andy Kaufman. I think I watched mm-hmm. that in sixth grade for the first time. I made my mom go back to Blockbuster every night and rent that movie for me. I used to go to, I had this really uptight sixth grade teacher and I used to, uh, you know, impersonate Tony Clifton to my teacher and I would get thrown out of class all the time. Loved it, you know. Yeah, it's just the, the, those those movies stuck with me in, in such a way that um, I haven't really felt that in a long time from from uh cinema you know um mm. again it's because we're not really focusing on the the simple dynamics of human relationship we're focusing on spectrum i need to watch all of those movies that you just said there's some of them i haven't seen i'm writing them all down <laughs> Eternal, well, i've seen eternal well, sunshine i own that one I like it but eternal sunshine is great yeah. you know you oh. have the same and part of the she has she has hair your exact color in part of the movie blue ruin that's the one scene that's what she says it's called blue ruin and you know what i'm i'm also just a fucked up girl looking for her own peace of mind you know like it's like just... that scene too when they're in the, i mean that's my favorite yeah. song i think from any movie it's called bookstore and it's like oh, this okay. minute it's like this minute little clip of the song that plays and yeah i mean when when they kiss and that song plays it's just like you know, I'm reading all this. I'm reading all these books now for some reason on like esoteric hermetic knowledge, but they all really talk about how the heart has more feeling sense like than the brain does. And like when you know, obviously yeah. the brain processes things, but your heart is what really feels, and your heart's your intuition. That's what really guides. It. And when you're feeling your levels of vibration, whether it's joy, you feel it here. You don't feel it there. And like mm-hmm. when that song plays, when they kiss, you I, every time I watch that, you feel it right there mm-hmm. you know? and that's the magic that's that's the magic that's what we're all trying to uh like that's what this art form is trying to find is is that awesome answer <laughs> a very awesome answer yeah, we're, we're we're long-winded and i talked about stuff you didn't ask me but it's it's it's, it's so all connected people have asked me like what are your favorite what's your favorite movie and you can't you can't just narrow down one you know it's like such a tough it's such a tough thing because they're all i mean some of those some of those, they're all so good I obviously watch your Instagram stories all the time and you're posting about food and I, oh, sometimes you post some like amazing stuff and I want to know your top five favorite restaurants or top five places to eat in LA. Right. Um, Well, my father was out here. So I took my dad's and my five favorite places. And again, like I'm not really attracted to like the scene places that everyone shows up. I like the hole in the walls. Those are my favorites. I would have to say now. And this is not a fancy place. I love going there with my friend Liz, one of my best friends. There's this there's this Chinese place in Venice called Mao's. And it's like right off the boardwalk. It's right off the main area. And it's some of the best Chinese food I've ever had. Their chicken with yams is amazing. I love Mao's. It's just a communal table. It's it's good food, mm. inexpensive. Every time I go there, I'm like, it's the best Chinese food I've ever had. On the Chinese trend, I live right down the street from Formosa Cafe. Formosa Cafe was this old 1930. It was an old star hangout. All the stars went to Formosa. 
Uh, the inside is made to look, it's old Hollywood. It's all red lights, you know, brass balls, all old headshots. The back of the bar, the back bar, they took from this famous old Chinese restaurant in downtown LA. They built it in there. Their orange chicken at Formosa is an absolute 10 out of 10. The best I've ever had. I love, I love Formosa Cafe for the old Hollywood feel for the food and just for like the ambience. It's, it's an amazing mm. spot. If I was going to go with Mexican, there's this place, Galagetza, which is in Koreatown, which is off Olympic Boulevard. And uh, it's, I love mole. And mole is the special sauce that's, you know, made from cocoa. Which, you know, it used to be what the emperors used to eat. But they have the James Beard Award for the best mole in the world. And I oh. love, I love their mole. You go in there, you know, there's always a live band playing. It's authentic, real incredible food always crowded always a good vibe gala guess is great when i first moved here i have a i have a, a another actor friend matt malloy who i'm sure if you would be like oh that guy but he goes when you come to la i'll take you to my favorite my favorite restaurant for lunch and it's this dive bar in venice again i like going i, I grew up with the beach so i like the beach there's this place called hanano's cafe and it is a true 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 old school dive bar to the in the best way imaginable you know it's like saw dust on the floors you know it gets real rowdy at night everyone in venice you can imagine goes there their burger is the best burger in la it's just gr a greasy spoon burger so good um love the vibe there love venice uh what do we have we're at three was that three or was that four no that was, was four this is tough since now it's down because i like i like a lot of places out here I guess I'm going to have to go with Versailles. You know, I love Cuban food. And there, I mean, there's a Versailles in Miami, which is on 8th Street in Cali Ocho, which is better. It's not, it's not the same restaurant. I wouldn't say it's better, it's just different. And as a kid, I used to go to that Versailles all the time. I love Cuban food. My favorite restaurant of all time is this Cuban spot in the Florida Keys called Manny Anisa's, which... Basically, all of South Florida does their key lime pie, Manny Misa style. It's the best you've ever had. Um, but I just love Cuban. And the Versailles out here is a different company, but there's three of them. And they do this. Again, it's not fancy at all. I went there the other night. I got. Uh, I was feeling sick. I got a chicken and black bean soup. And they do this garlic chicken, which is this huge half chicken. Just cut up fresh onions, this garlic sauce on top, black beans and rice and plantains. Amazing. And uh, I love Cafe Con Leches, one of my fa my favorite treats. And when I lived in New York, I lived down from this Dominican bakery, not Cuban, called Annie's Pastry Shop or Annie's Bake Shop. And I used to go there and get a guava pastry and a Cafe Con Leche on Sundays. I love guava pastries. They're my favorite. And uh, a good <laughs> Cafe Con Leche is unbelievable. But I, I went to in Versailles the other night. I had another Cafe Con Leche there and a Tres Leches cake and a flan. I got both of them. and. Uh, yeah, it just, for me, it's like the nostalgia, you know, yeah. it's like, I love like feeling like I'm back in the Florida Keys. I love that kind of food because that's what I used to eat with my parents when I was younger. So it's just kind of like the the nostalgia of of doing that. But yeah, again, like nothing soup. I, I don't, I mean, like, I, I, I like eating out of fancy spots too, but when you, it's like when you leave a movie, it's like if you leave, I don't want anything pretentious. You know, I just want something mm -hmm. that's that enters my system and sticks with me and those places always stick with me i have never obviously tried any of those things but my i'm still salivating constantly the whole time you're yeah. talking about it i'm like i don't even know what it tastes like and i'm already salivating and i want it right now <laughs> you know, just watch my instagram stories you'll see you'll see a lot <laughs> uh, i have to leave two dessert spots too because i'm talking about that i used to live in studio city when i first got here and there's a coffee shop there called Republic of Pie. Now, there's two places in L.A. that are there's House of Pies, which I also like a lot, too. But there's Republic of Pie, which is different. Republic of Pie is this coffee bake shop that's off Magnolia Boulevard. And their cherry pie with fresh whipped cream is 10 out of 10. So good. There is a, a gelato spot here called Fata Morgiano's. And... They have like 10 or 15 different kinds of just chocolate gelato. They have like tobacco chocolate gelato, Belgian dark. I mean, their, their gelato is like hands down the best gelato ice cream I've ever had. It, it's I usually do like prickly pear, which is this bright fuchsia color gelato. And the um, 
chocolates and like their Belgian dark chocolate. It's just so good. I go there with my friend Liz all the time too. It's it's one of our spots. I will say that LA is a great food city. And mm-hmm. that's one of the good things about living here is that there's so many good little places. And that's part of the fun of uncovering this city is that every area has somewhere good to go check out and find. My, my biggest gripe about the food scene here that most places here do blonde rose coffee and i love dark rose coffee why do they do mostly blonde rose there i don't know it's just a kind of a california thing and like you know i I, living in new york for 12 years one of the one of the best parts about the city are the coffee trucks you know you walk around like Mm. there's coffee you get a coffee a bagel a coffee a muffin it's like 225 for both right out here you go to coffee shops it's like 450 for a 12 ounce blonde rose coffee and i'm like this is crazy yeah Coffee, sh- coffee should be for the people, all right. Not, not for the elites. Charging you four fifty for a cup of coffee. Exactly. You do post a lot about the prices and stuff in LA. And I was curious, like, if you could live somewhere else, where would you live if you didn't have to live there for like your career and stuff? Like, where would you want to live? Where would you be your dream spot? I mean, the Florida Keys is one of the best places in the world. You know, I. I I obviously romanticized that a little bit since I just spent time down there. I spent time down there when I was a kid a lot, and I have just nothing but fond memories. Parts of New England are so beautiful in upstate New York. Mm. Like, uh, I used to leave the city and go up to Sleepy Hollow in Terrytown a lot and talk about beautiful fall foliage. You know, that's where Sleepy Hollow Cemetery is, and you take the train out of New York and just the most beautiful orange-yellow trees you've ever seen. Food up there is great. There's tons of space. A lot of old taverns. It's romantic and it's rustic in a way that you like when you think about like fall, that's the exact fall place you want to be. I don't know. I mean, I I guess ultimately the goal is to have a place here, to have a place in New England somewhere because New mm. England, beautiful coasts. I need to add a couple places to my bucket list now. <laughs> <laughs> One more question for you that I'm curious about, and that is. The license plates that you post in your Instagram story, how did that happen? How did that start? Oh, yeah. So it started from, uh, I guess I was just, everyone out here is vanity plates. And uh, (laughs) for better or worse, take from that what you you want. But everyone here is vanity plates. So it just became kind of like when I first got here. And I guess I kind of ran into the danger of doing this. I was comparing everything to like New York and the East Coast, being like, oh, the bagels here suck. Oh, they suck. Yeah. And then, no, not, not everyone does. But in some ways, I was just kind of like making a mockery of stuff in LA. It's just kind of like my social media presence, like having kind of fun with it. And I would do it to rise out of a lot of like my, uh, my I was like twisting the needle for my, for my LA friends. But it just kind of started because I was like posting some of these ridiculous vanity plates, you know, like Sugar Daddy and stuff like that. You see some weird ones and you're just like, who who wants it on their car? And then some of my friends would see, like they would find them and they started seeing like how many actual vanity plates there are out here. And then mm-hmm. they would send me some crazy ones that they've seen. And it just kind of started from that where it's like, I think everyone wanted to join in on the fun. Yeah. Every time I see one now, I'm like, geez, if I wasn't driving, I'd take a picture and Take bread in that. That's that's <laughs> my so job. I drive behind and I have like my phone and I'm trying to get a picture of everything. But I've seen I've seen some I've seen some, I forgot one I saw the other day that I thought it was like Mr. Sugar or something, which I thought was kind of fun. I mean, I live in West Hollywood, so you're gonna get some some fun ones like that. This was awesome having you on. Thank you so much for being so gracious and coming on here and it's a little tiny podcast for me and it was so great talking to you and I was so excited and so nervous because like I say it's my like favorite found footage movies and I love it so much and I just think it's so well done and you did well, such a good job that really means a lot so you know it's, it, I had a great time talking so you know always, always reach out if you want to chat thank you for watching this very very special episode with Brett Lotta, I'm so, so honored. Thank you so much. You can find more of my content on our YouTube channel, Not A Strong Start. You can follow me on my Instagram page at Marie Plays It All. You can follow us at Twitter and Instagram at Not A Strong Start. And you can find us on anywhere you listen to your podcasts. And where can we find you, Brett Lotta? And where can we watch Vanny Baker Tate? Well, my Instagram is uh, Brett Meets World and it's spelled with one T. So it's B-R-E-T-M-E-T-T-S-W-O-R-L-D. Uh, Andy Baker tape right now is on Tubi, Amazon, Apple, Screenbox, Roku, Voodoo. I think we're on all those platforms. Uh, I think Terror Films, who's our distributor, has us on their YouTube channel. So watch it that way. 
Instagram is the Andy Baker tape and all the links for it are up on there. So if anyone feels compelled to follow, please do. I'll follow you back. Send them some um, license plate photos, tag them in your license plate photos. I will certainly repost all license plate photos sentiment.